for those watching online especially, I want to remind you that we need scientists, and especially engineers, for the future. Engineers use science to solve problems and make things. We need these people so that the United States can continue to innovate and continue to be a world leader. We need innovation, and that needs science education. Okay. Can you Go make a sex it. tape on Mars? I think so. It's 40% of the gravity. Okay. Oh. Just think you'd be not floating. So it'd be like this whole, like, less than half. Edwin Hubble was sitting at Mount Wilson, which is up from Pasadena, California. On a clear day, you can look down and see where the Rose Parade goes. It's, it's that close to civilization. But even uh, in the early 1900s, the people who selected this site for astronomy picked an excellent site. The, the, the clouds and smog are below you. And Edwin Hubble sat there at his, this very big telescope, night after night, studying the heavens. And he found that the stars are moving apart. The stars are moving apart. And he wasn't sure why, but it was, it was clear that the stars are moving farther and farther apart all the time. So people talked about it for a couple decades. And then eventually uh, another astronomer, almost a couple decades, another astronomer, Fred Hoyle, just remarked, uh, well, it was like there was a big bang. Uh, there was an explosion. This is to say, since everything's moving apart, it's very reasonable that at one time they were all together. And there's a place from whence, or rather whence, these things uh, expanded. And it was a remarkable insight. But people went uh, still questioning it for decades, science and conventional scientists questioning it for decades. Uh, these two researchers wanted to listen for radio signals from space, radio astronomy. And this is while we have visible light for our eyes, there's a whole nother bunch of waves uh, of light that are much longer. The microwaves in your oven are about that long. The radar at the airport is about that long. Your uh, FM radio signals about like this. Uh, AM radio signals are kilometer. There are a couple, several soccer fields. They went out uh, listening, and there was this hiss, this tss, all the time that wouldn't go away. And they thought, oh, doggone it, there's some loose connector. They plugged in the connector. They, they re-screwed it, they made it tight. They turned it this way, the hiss was still there. They heard it that way, it's just still there. They thought it was pigeon droppings that had affected the reception of this horn, it's called. This thing is still there. It's in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. It's a National Historic Site. And Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson had found this cosmic background sound that was predicted by astronomers. Astronomers running the numbers, doing math, predicted that in the cosmos would be left over this echo, this, this energy from the Big Bang that would be detectable. And they detected it. We built the cosmic observatory for background emissions, the COBE spacecraft, and it matched exactly, exactly the astronomers' predictions. You gotta respect that. Underway here on Earth, I mean, you know, if the moon well, had erupting volcanoes uh, a few years ago, uh, well, a few million years ago, whatever, however you no, want to put billion. it, uh, yeah. you know, it, it's not like we've been up there burning fossil fuels. Uh, no, volcanoes are not connected to the burning of fossil fuels, they're no, connected but to mining. But the big thing for us on my side of this thing is the science is true. And so uh, when you discover, the people who got really involved in climate change got involved in it often by studying the Venus, the planet Venus. So the, the physics, the science that happens on Venus is the same as the science that happens on the Earth. The science that happens on the moon, in this case the geology, the study of rocks that happens on the moon, is the same science that happens on the Earth. So when you say to yourself, well, I'm going to ignore all the evidence of climate change, you're saying, I'm going to ignore the best ideas anybody's. Now, when we go to the Grand Canyon, which is an astonishing place, and I recommend to everybody in the world to someday visit the Grand Canyon, you find layer upon layer of ancient rocks. And if there was this enormous flood that you speak of, wouldn't there have been churning and bubbling and roiling how would these things have settled out? Your claim that they settled out in an extraordinary short amount of time 
is for me not satisfactory. You can look at these rocks, you can look at rocks that are younger, you can go to seashores where there's sand. This is what geologists on the outside do, study what, uh, the rate at which soil is deposited at the end of rivers and deltas, and we can see that it takes a long, long time for sediments to turn to stone. Also in this picture you can see where one type of sediment has intruded on another type. Now if that was uniform, wouldn't we expect it all to be even without intrusion? Furthermore, you can find places in the Grand Canyon where you see an ancient riverbed on that side going to an ancient riverbed on that side, and the Colorado River has cut through it. And by the way, if this great flood drained through, through the Grand Canyon, wouldn't there have been a Grand Canyon on every continent? How could we not have Grand Canyons everywhere? if this water drained away in this extraordinary short amount of time, 4,000 years. Now, when you look at these layers carefully, you find these beautiful fossils. And when I say beautiful, I am inspired by them. They're remarkable because we are looking at the past. You find down low, you'll find what you might consider as uh, rudimentary sea animals. Up above, you'll find the famous trilobites. Above that, you might find some clams, some oysters, and above that, you find some mammals. You never, ever find a higher animal mixed in with a lower one. You never find a lower one trying to swim its way to the higher one. If it all happened in such an extraordinary short amount of time, if this water drained away just like that, wouldn't we expect to see some turbulence? And by the way, anyone here, really, if you can find one example of that, one example of that anywhere in the world, the scientists of the world challenge you. It, they would embrace you. You would be a hero. You would change the world if you could find one example of that anywhere. People have looked and looked and looked. They have not found a single one. Richie, you know what I think? I agree. Not that you ask, but what I think on this is uh, consciousness has kind of baffled us for a while, okay? And evidence that we haven't a clue about what consciousness is, is drawn from the, in, from the fact of how many books are published on the topic, right? We're not really continuing to publish books, not really, on like Newtonian physics. It's done, all right? So, so the fact that people keep publishing books on consciousness is the evidence we don't know anything about it, because if we knew all about it, you wouldn't have to keep publishing. So, so what I wonder, what I wonder, Richard, is whether there really is no such thing as consciousness at all, and that there's some other understanding of the functioning of the human brain that renders that question obsolete. To that, I've got to say, like, oh, wow. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. And am, I, am I, like, thinking? Or am I just, like, thinking that I'm thinking? Like, wow. <laughs> Will you Richard, stop? Oh, right, right, sorry. Richard. We went, we went decades, we went decades not understanding the precession of mercury. It was this big mystery, and we invented solutions to it, like a mysterious planet Vulcan tugging on it such that the, its, per, its perihelion processed. And, and that wasn't the explanation at all. It was obviously general relativity, another thing, not the original question <laughs> we were asking. So, you say you want to know what consciousness is, maybe that's not even the right question. How about okay. this? What's the nature of consciousness? Excellent. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, I, Tracy, I think I want to uh, direct this one to you. Um, Who's you? To Tracy. Um, that's, that's, <laughs> not, that's not Neil. I'll be happy. Okay, be okay. Part of shifting our political culture, I think, is we got to model for our kids that facts matter. If, if we know that the Everglades are starting to get salt water in them, and we know that that's going to affect 
the alligators and the herons and the birds in this place and, and uh, ultimately going to affect our drinking water and we see the facts. We have to acknowledge those facts. We can argue about how to fix it. And Mr. President, I'll be honest with you, I was born in the U.S. I was trained as an engineer in the U.S. I'm a patriot. Both of my parents were veterans of World War II. They're interred at Arlington. And I want the U.S. to lead. I want the U.S. to be the best in the world at the new, the solutions and the, the innovations and what it's going to take to address climate change for the betterment of everybody. We're, we're, we're getting busy. Uh, America's beginning to lead. Uh, because of our leadership in putting forward a climate plan that was pretty aggressive, China for the first time uh, has submitted its own plan. Uh, and what we're trying to do is now mobilize the world. In Paris in the fall, we're going to have a conference to see if we can arrive at a global agreement around uh, tackling climate change in a serious way. Uh, but you're absolutely right that if America is not at the forefront, it will not happen. That's and right. Yeah, I always say to people, part of what makes America exceptional, it's not just the size of our economy or the power of our military, but it's the power of our ideas and the power of our example. And, uh, and there's a good uh, moment for us to lead. So Absolutely. thank you, Bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Great conversation. Thank you, sir. Mr. Ham and his followers have this remarkable view of uh, a worldwide flood that somehow influenced everything that we observe in nature, a 500-foot wooden boat, eight zookeepers for 14,000 individual animals, every land plant in the world underwater for a full year? I ask us all, is that really reasonable? You'll hear a lot about the Grand Canyon, I imagine, also, which is a remarkable place, and it has fossils. And the fossils in the Grand Canyon are found in layers. There is not a single place in the Grand Canyon where the fossils of one type of animal cross over into the fossils of another. In other words, when there was a big flood on the earth, you would expect drowning animals to swim up to a higher level. Not any one of them did, not a single one. If you could find evidence of that, my friends, you could change the world. One of the extraordinary claims associated with uh, Mr. Ham's worldview is that this uh, giant boat, very large wooden ship, went aground safely on a mountain in the Middle East, what we now call the Middle East. And so places like Australia are populated then by animals who somehow managed to get from the Middle East all the way to Australia in the last 4,000 years. Now that to me is an extraordinary claim. We would expect then somewhere between the Middle East and Australia, we would expect to find evidence of kangaroos. We would expect to find uh, some fossils, some bones. In the last 4,000 years, somebody would have been hopping along there and died along the way, and we'd find them. And furthermore, there's a claim that there was a land bridge that allowed these animals to get from Asia all the way to the continent of Australia, and that land bridge has disappeared, has disappeared in the last 4,000 years. No navigator, no diver, no U.S. Navy submarine. No one's ever detected any evidence of this, let alone any fossils of kangaroos. So your expectation is not met. It doesn't seem to hold up. Another uh, remarkable thing I'd like everybody to consider, along inherent in this world view, is that somehow Noah and his family were able to build a wooden ship that would house 14,000 individuals. There are 7,000 kinds, and, then, and every, there's a boy and a girl for each one of those. So it's about 14,008 people. And these people were unskilled. As far as anybody knows, they had never built a wooden ship before. Furthermore, they had to get all these animals on there, and they had to feed them. And I understand that Mr. Ham has some explanations for that, which I frankly find extraordinary. But uh, uh, this is the premise of the bit. And we can then run a test, a scientific test. People in the early 1900s built an extraordinary large wooden ship, the Wyoming. It was a six-masted schooner, the largest one ever built. It had a motor on it for winching cables and stuff. But this boat had uh, a great difficulty. It was uh, not as big as the Titanic, but it was a very long ship. It would twist in the sea. It would twist this way, this way, and this way. 
And in all that twisting, it leaked. It leaked like crazy. The crew could not keep the ship dry. And indeed, it eventually foundered and sank a loss of all 14 hands. So there were 14 crewmen aboard a ship built by very, very skilled shipwrights in New England. These guys were the best in the world at wooden shipbuilding. And they couldn't build a boat as big as the ark is claimed to have been. Is that reasonable? Is that possible? That the best shipbuilders in the world couldn't do what uh, eight unskilled people, uh, men and their wives, uh, were able to do? Shipwrights, my ancestors, the Nye family in New England, took, spent their whole life learning to make ships. I mean, it's very reasonable perhaps to you that Noah had superpowers and was able to build this extraordinary craft with seven family members, but to me it's just uh, not reasonable. Even if what Van and the White House are saying is all true, the scare tactics have not worked. Check let me out. ask you before you go on. Well, no, let me finish my true. question. Let's talk about the, the facts. You're saying that no, no, no. Not let true. me finish my question, Bill. I want you to take a look at this polling. Um, only about 36 percent of Americans think global warming is a serious threat to our way of life. Now, again, let me let me pause it. Everything that Van and the White House have said is true. However. The scare tactics have not worked, and don't you need public consensus to move the needle on this? So how do you want to get public consensus? By saying that it's not happening, that it's not serious, that shorelines aren't flooding, that we're no, not... No, I want you to advise the, advise the oh, politicians. Oh, advise the politicians. Because they're not, whatever they're doing, whatever Van is doing to scare the public, is not changing Inform public opinion. Inform the public, but go right ahead. <laughs> tell us, so tell us how to use the science to actually change public consensus. Well, I get the message out that this is serious business. And, you know, if you live in uh, Oklahoma where tornadoes have wiped your town out a couple times, if you, and you, you chose Alaska, which is remote generally, but when you start, you remember Hurricane Sandy, mm -hmm. the bottom half of Manhattan was flooded. Yeah. The economic effect of that alone is enormous, let alone the rebuilding infrastructure and so on. And we're in the developed world where people can get on the highway and drive. You know, when you say moving a highway four feet, it doesn't sound like very much, but you're talking about millions of tons of road that have to be lifted, and that energy has to come from somewhere, and that's just the start of things. Uh, well, and so uh, when we start having crop failures and the drought that's in California continues, the economic cost... Well, yeah, well, you can look at these things, and, and you can look at the climate realities, and even this NCA report says that the, the trend on tornadoes is uncertain. The IPCC report so says that the trend so on hurricanes is okay. uncertain. We're in the longest hurricane drought. I'm not, I'm not a denier. I'm not a skeptic. What I'm saying is the climate is changing. Yes, man-made emissions are in some part to that, but we haven't seen these extreme weather event trends. The observed data doesn't prove that. Well, so I More importantly so, is the, okay. the policy prescriptions, these greenhouse gas regulations coming down, uh, prohibiting building new coal-fired power plants, is just going to make us less equipped, less economically prosperous to handle these problems, uh, whether they're you know, more frequent and more so intense So let's or just not. start with we don't agree on the facts, right? So this, this third report came out saying it's very serious. You say no. Right? That's, there's the essence of the problem, S.E. Well, the science, yeah, the, the researchers say yes, you... Not all the researchers. And again, hope. even the IPCC says that there's no uh, frequency or intensity when it comes to hurricanes. So, okay, hurricane, so, schmurricane, if I may. This one the says about tornadoes. Hit. That's the same thing. In yeah, sea level is rising, hit. although it's, it's retracted. It, it's um, increasing at a slower rate over the past few years. We've had okay. Arctic I ice think globally you're increasing. Data. I think no, that's not not absolutely. Why did this report no, come out? And, and but like, Bill, isn't yeah. it a problem when science guys attempt to bully other people? I mean, Nick well, here had to say, me, "I'm not a denier." He had to get it up. I'm not a denier because really. The, the science group has tried to shame anyone who dares question this, okay. and the point I'm Why trying to make... Thank you. Moderation on that. <laughs> uh, but the, the, uh, innovation is what's going to make the United States economy grow. And in right. order to have uh, uh, innovation, you have to have scientifically literate students being graduated from uh, all kinds of schools. Now, this seems objective, as you say. It would seem like... Who wouldn't want the United States to innovate? Isn't this the greatest thing? Right. But you have this situation in Texas where uh, people want to have creationism in textbooks. Oh, sure. Now, uh, unlike s some other acquaintances of mine, I don't have any big deal about somebody's religion. But if you claim... 
If you but, claim that no. the Earth is 10,000 years old, that's just wrong. No, they say 5,000. 5,000. It's just wrong. The Earth is flat. No, it isn't. And so this is to your point. Well, you're, you're, I mean, you're quoting facts. How much do we really know about facts? <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the problem, is that, is that facts themselves have become subject to oh, debate. Man. And this, this must Crazy. drive you fucking nuts. <laughs> <laughs> right, look yeah. at him. He's going. Yeah, yeah. So, but, no, it really is troubling well, because... Uh, well, you are used to explaining things to children. Explain to Republicans right now. <laughs> what? What? So, well, I'm sorry, Democrats in that bunch too. Oh boy, there's right? not a lot of Democrats who think the world is five thousand years. Yeah, old. yeah. There are some, you're right. There are some. That, there are there are religious concerned. Democrats. Yeah, yeah, that's that's Democrats. But I mean, right. I mean, you you cast a, a, a jaundiced eye at me about religion, but isn't no, I was religion... giving you a hard time. I know, but I you should, you should give love. religion the hard time. I, I mean, I read that you were in, I think it was Texas, and you quoted oh, Genesis yeah. about and a Genesis something like God made two great lights, the sun and the moon, and you pointed out to the crowd that the moon, of course. It's not a light itself. It's just reflecting the light off the sun. And they threw a shit fit and stormed out of the a room. A woman grabbed her kids by the wrists and took them out. Right. Which was uh, kind of cool, but uh, <laughs> also But you troubling. cannot see that and not know that religion oh. is the enemy of science. Oh, and when man. people say we can reconcile science and faith, no, we can't. Well, the whole thing is, when, in science, when, it's when you have claims. That's the big deal. So if you claim the Earth is 10,000 years old, that, that's just wrong. I mean, uh, rubidium becomes strontium, and there's this extraordinary half-life, and that's how we determine these things. And the same way, uh, as I said at that thing in Waco, I said, it looks to me like whoever wrote this uh, didn't really have it right. And bear in mind, everybody, this has been translated, I don't know how many times from Sanskrit. Maybe the guy was pretty savvy, actually, and it just got messed up. You know, the moon is out all day. I don't want to shock you. Uh, and so, uh, there's no reason. The moon, it's a pebble. <laughs> The There's moon is only 290,000 miles away, right? Uh, I, I have more miles on my United <laughs> Airlines yeah. thing than that. Well, and you can get there in three days. And, uh, you know, bear in mind, just changing the subject slightly, you know South Africa has a space program because they know that if they get 8,000 PhD people running around in South Africa, their quality of life's going to go up. So everybody, we have a mission going to Jupiter that's going to swing by the Earth on October 9th. Don't miss it if you can. We have a mission. People say, what's your favorite planet? Pluto. OK, we're going to go to Pluto. It'll be there in 2015. <laughs> These things take an extraordinary 